Bibles, I'd please invite you to open to Isaiah chapter number 2. Isaiah chapter number 2. Now this is a, a, a series we'll be going through, the book of Isaiah, that I began many, many, many weeks ago, like about five weeks ago. Or so, And so I have no doubt that you have no recollection of that first sermon. And so I'll preach the whole first sermon, then I'll preach the second sermon because I wouldn't want you to miss anything in the process. Amen? A little less than, uh, Brother Trevor, you didn't say amen. Don't you love preaching from the Word of God? Amen. Wow. <laughs> I can still see you. I know. Uh, I will catch up a little bit on that because it'll be um, relevant to the, to the sermon tonight, just some of those introductory thoughts. But I want to take a few moments and read the entire chapter from Isaiah chapter 2. Uh, we will not read every chapter in Isaiah as we go through it, but this chapter, there's some key thoughts and some key ideas tonight that I want, with the Lord's help, uh, to relate and to impart tonight that God has given to us. And then uh, one major point that God puts for us right here that we can miss. A, a book of Isaiah, like Isaiah, can be at times difficult uh, to ingest. All right, there are some parts of Isaiah that if you're reading along in the Word of God, you're like, wow, what is going on in Isaiah? Like, what is happening? Isaiah, one of the major prophets uh, who prophesied through a, a few different kings and who went about just making these phrases, thus saith the Lord. All right, his words were not his words. They were God's words. He was a mouthpiece for God. And, and God's word not being in the same written form, like the, the completeness that we have now, God would speak through the prophets, and he spoke through Isaiah. And Isaiah's message was... Uh, Seldom, and the prophets' messages were seldom received uh, with acceptance and vigor. They were typically and almost always rejected with the messenger being hated and despised and treated cruelly. Now, there are exceptions to the prophets where there are times the children of Israel would turn back to God. That was always God's desire. Hear the message and repent and return. But seldom did that happen throughout the course of the history of the prophets. And so these men would, would literally spend their lives proclaiming truth without error and almost always universally being rejected for it and being hated and despised. And kings saying, listen, don't listen to him. He doesn't speak anything good about me. Others shunning him. All you do is, is bring condemnation and, and I don't think that you're from God. And all of these accusations, and yet they were faithful. They were committed, and they were called to be mouthpieces for God. At times, we're going to face those oppositions in life, but we must remain committed and faithful and mouthpieces for God. So Isaiah chapter 2, if you have your Bibles open, please, we'll look at the entire chapter where the Bible begins, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, and let us go up to the mountains of the Lord, or mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye, and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves in the children of strangers. Verse 7. Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself. Therefore forgive them not. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty." The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every one that is proud and lofty, and upon every one that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. And upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon all the high mountains, and upon all the hills that are lifted up, and upon every high tower, and upon every fenced wall, and upon all the ships of Tarshish, 
and upon all pleasant pictures. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. And the idols he shall utterly abolish, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. When he ariseth, he shake terribly the earth. In that day... A man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they have made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and to the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Cease ye from man whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of. Lord, as we look at your word tonight, I ask that you would help you would help your word to, be go, to go forth in power. Lord, as we listen, may we not just listen with our ears, but listen with our hearts. Would your spirit touch us? Lord, as we are challenged by your word and by your spirit, may we respond in the affirmative to you and truly say in our heart, in our life, I choose Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would work in this service and keep us free from distractions. And Lord, let nothing would happen that would hinder your word tonight. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Isaiah chapter 2. I'm entitled the message, Who is in Charge? I presented the first week, we looked at Isaiah, and I'll remind you of this, that I would submit that the, the theme of Isaiah is the fact that God is high and lifted up. We find that key verse, we'll get there in a few weeks, in Isaiah chapter 6, Verse 1, where it says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I, that is Isaiah, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. This idea of God being not of location in height, but in exaltation, is prevalent throughout the book of Isaiah. That God is not just in the heaven of heavens, the heavenlies, but that God in his position of authority and power is higher than everything else in the known and unknown universe. That there is nothing and no one greater than God Almighty. That his regal throne, the divine powerful throne of deity, is elevated beyond human comprehension and the very air is saturated with the glory of God. Where the cherubims echo that phrase, holy, holy, holy. This is the God of Isaiah. And throughout the book of Isaiah, we will see this theme over and over that God and God alone is high and lifted up. There's a sub-theme running through Isaiah that we will come across throughout this book, some tonight in chapter 2. But this is the sub-theme. Because God is high and lifted up, God will make these statements, I am not like you. And there could not be a truer statement. God is not like man. There is no comparison. And yet man continually tries to be like God. In fact, the very lie in the Garden of Eden, Satan said to Eve, tempting her, if you eat of the fruit, you will be as God. You will be as God. You will be like God. And what a deceptive lie. And yet this world is full of religions who promise God-like characteristics. If you do this, if you act this way, if you come or whatever it may be, then you will be as God. And the sub-theme through Isaiah is God says, I am not like you. My ways are not like your ways. My thoughts are not like your thoughts. For as the heavens are high above the earth, God says, in essence, that's how much distance there is between me and you. Yet in all of that grandeur, in all of that elevation, all of that glory, God also makes this profound statement in Isaiah that I will come and to be like you. Isaiah chapter 53, one of the most powerful and prophetic passages of Scripture in the Old Testament, where the Bible speaks, All we like sheep have gone astray. Anyone remember this passage of Scripture? Isaiah 53, verse 5 says this, But he, Jesus, was wounded for our transgressions. 
God high and lifted up cannot be wounded, but God who comes down to man can be wounded. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we're healed. The God who was high and lifted up came down to earth to relate, to touch, and to save. This is the God of Isaiah. This is a theme that we will see throughout the book of Isaiah, the suffering servant, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The God who is high and lifted up bridges the expanse to come to man, who, to be reminded, is not like God. But he makes another powerful promise in Isaiah. This is still an introduction, but it just, we'll get there eventually, but remember this promise. The high and lifted up holy of holies God says this, but they that wait upon the Lord, remember this now, shall renew their strength. This is Isaiah. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Who can cause you to soar above the frailties of life? The one who is high and lifted up. Who can cause your feet to be removed from the mires of the clay and the, and the, the things and the situation that will pull us down, the circumstances that will weigh us down? The one who is not like us. You know, all around us, people promise to soar like eagles. They make those promises. Follow this path of meditation and you will be released from your stress and anxiety. You will, you will soar. You'll find the relief you need. The only path is God himself. And so we come to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2, we discover in verse number 2 that the portion of Scripture will directly connect to the end times. In fact, verse number 2 says this, in the last days. Everybody see that in verse number 2? Thereby setting up in the prophecy what what God is going to be talking about in the next few verses. And so when Isaiah prophesied these things, those listening could have said, well, this doesn't happen today, and they would be right. In fact, as we read this passage, we find out in in verse number 2 that's the last days, in in verse number 4, that something's going to happen, that there is going to be peace in the judge, a judgment. Or in essence, we understand from this passage that this refers specifically to the time that Jesus Christ will physically rule on earth. There's a time that Jesus Christ will be not just the king of kings, but the physical judge on planet earth. On this earth, Jesus Christ will will rule and reign. And that is what this particular passage, chapter 2 of Isaiah, is going to speak about. And there's some some keys here that I think will help us, and then one that just unlocks something for us. But understand, in this, we see this thought in chapter 2. It says that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. Now, remember the theme of Isaiah, high and lifted up, God? In this book, we'll also find these phrases, the mountain of the Lord, the holy mountain, the the, the top of the mountain. We find it in in Isaiah chapter 2. We find it in Isaiah chapter 30, in Isaiah chapter 11, Isaiah chapter 56, Isaiah chapter 57, Isaiah chapter 65, Isaiah chapter 66. Also found in Ezekiel, Daniel, and Obadiah, and in the book of Revelation. And what we know from that is when God speaks of the the mountain that he's going to rule on, he will establish himself in a very specific place, which we know as as the the, the promised land in the Old Testament, but now where is in in the land of Israel. And that's where Jesus Christ will physically rule. He says on the mountain, now in that specific area around Jerusalem, there are actually seven different mountaintops. I believe he'll be on Mount Zion. The Bible talks about Mount Zion, one of those mountaintops, and that's where the holy city of Jesus Christ will rule at that point. This is the essence of Isaiah chapter 2, where he establishes his thousand-year earthly kingdom. Now, I realize that some of that is just interesting, and like, oh, that's neat. I didn't know, you know God's theme and then kind of his point. But in Isaiah chapter 2, now, I want to dig in a little deeper and see what what. God prophesies will specifically happen because there's a lesson for us from this passage that ought to, ought to challenge us today. I want to notice, first of all, tonight, the first point, the revelation of God's reign. The revelation of God's reign. In Isaiah chapter 2, there's some scripture that's given that's going to reveal how and what God's reign will look like. 
And the first point I want to point out is found in verse number 7, where it says, Their land also is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of the chariots. For the next few verses, 7, 8, and 9, and following, we will find out that when God comes to reign, the scenario is that man will be worshiping his own devices. And this is true in 2024. Mankind worships, 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 worships his own devices. In this passage, it talks about the works of their own hands and things their fingers have made. Or in essence, man will be proud of himself and his accomplishments. Now this happens today, does it not? People make something, they build something, they discover something, and they, they sing their own praises. Look at me. You can go no further than a professional sporting event. And someone takes a piece of artificial leather or dead animal skin and throws it in a good way. And then they're like, yeah, look at me. Like this is some great feat. Now perhaps they can throw something farther than we can throw something. Perhaps. And maybe they can throw it with more consistency than we can throw something. But what kind of feat is this? Yet it's indicative of the problem that mankind has. They're tempted to worship themselves. Look at me. Look at what I've done. It sneaks into the common man who will look at his house and look at his family and, and look at his vehicles and look at his bank account and say, wow, look what I have done. Look at my successes. Look at how I've nailed this. I have really just ridden up. And through 7, 8, and 9, we see that their land is full of idols. Verse number 9, the mean man boweth down and the great man humbled himself. They're all worshiping their own devices and their own things. Man loves to worship his own things. I'd like to say that this was just a problem back there in the children of Israel. And I'd like to say it's just going to be a problem in the, it, when the millennial reign begins, but it's not true. Because it's the same old problem that you and I will face and we see, we'll face it every day of the week. Where we're tempted to look around and, and say, wow, look at what's happened. Look at my achievements. Our pride extends beyond mere self-promotion but becomes an anthem which echoes the halls of our creations and then stands in direct opposition to the true creator who's made all things. The pride that we have in saying, wow, I'm doing a pretty good job. Wow, I'm a pretty good person. We find it in comparison. Well, I'm glad I'm not like so-and-so. Wow, they're really bad news. But me, and then that pride sneaks in. We find in our possessions, we find it in our accomplishments. Some will hold on to their wealth thinking thereby that's what's the most important thing in life. I read a story about a lady, and she had been robbed. It was her safe deposit box at the bank. Some robbers broke in, and they'd taken out of the safe deposit boxes over $7 million. Apparently this lady saw that, and she began to weep and cry when she found out. And she said this, everything I had was in there. My whole life was in that box. When I read that little illustration and was going to use it tonight, I had another thought. There are some times when we come to a funeral and they're in a box. And it could be said because of their own deviations and their own exaltation, everything they had is in that box. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 2 that this time there will be all of these things that people will look at. And they'll be saying, look at us. Look at what we've done. Look at the idols that we have made. Look what our hands have done. Look and worship these things. Look what our fingers have accomplished. We are amazing. And remember the, thing of, the theme of Isaiah. God is high and lifted up. Notice during this time that not only is man proud of himself and proud of his things, but that God will demand worship of himself. Two, two different verses to notice. Please notice, first of all, verse 11. It says, The lofty looks of man shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of man shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. 
Can you read that last phrase with me, please? And I'll start, and the Lord, and read that with me. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. One more time. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Slide down in case you miss it to verse 17. And the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low. Read this with me. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Who will be exalted in that day? God. And God alone. In between verses number 12 and 17, you're going to find these words about mankind. Those that are proud and lofty. Verse number 12, lift it up and they'll be brought low. In verse number 13, you're going to find comparison to trees that were well-respected, comparing them to mankind, high and lifted up. In verse number 14, the high mountains and the hills that are lifted up. In verse number 15, the high tower and the fenced walls, uh, uh, symbols of strength. In verse number 16, symbols of wealth, ships of Tarshish, and all pleasant pictures. And verse 17, of course, that every point of pride, every self-exaltation, everything that someone could claim, God says, in that day, there's only one person to worship. He says, that's me. What a great day that's going to be. Now the easy application is, Lord, come quickly. Lord, come quickly because this world's a mess. Lord, come establish your kingdom because it's not getting better out there. People aren't getting more humble. They're not coming to God more. Like, Lord, it's a mess out there. So, Lord, come quickly and set up your kingdom Make it truly the last days, and and we will worship you. And that will truly be an amazing day. Early in the chapter, verses 2, 3, and 4, we talk about people turning their spears to something else. All right, and that day there's not fighting. There's just vineyards and planting. All right, there's no war. There's great peace that day, all in this millennial reign. And so the easy thing is, Lord, just bring this day. But there's something that's amazing here. This whole chapter, or almost all the chapter, is talking about the future of what will happen. But right smack dab in the middle, there is a call to action. That maybe you caught when I read it, but I want to point it out. We're going to talk about it in just a few moments. Because right in the middle, in the middle of all this, there is a call to everyone. Look, please, in verse number 5, where the Bible says, O house of Jacob, come ye... And let us walk in the light of the Lord. Now, this is incredible because this chapter before is talking about in the last days. After this is talking about what will happen. There's all this prophecy. But right there at verse number five, it is as if Isaiah pauses. And under the authority of, of God himself, he lay, it's like he looks around. And he looks around at his, these people who are his, his peers all right, these, these friends who he knows or perhaps these neighbors he has had or, or others, others, perhaps those in authority, a king or others. And he says this, listen, would you please, let's do a favor, house of Jacob, come ye. It is not a future tense, it is a current call. Come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. And my friends, that is the call that I want to make tonight to you and to I. To tonight, let us walk in the light of of the Lord. It is not just a call to our ears, but a charge to our hearts. It is a call and a challenge that charges us with simplicity. Walk in the light of the Lord. It's an invitation to step out of the wanderings of our shadows of self-wisdom, to abandon the darkness of our own logic, to resist the obscurity of sin in our life, the stumbling that comes because of pride and selfishness, and to boldly stride, to boldly walk in the brilliance of God's light. Let us walk in the light of the Lord. A time to cease from our own wandering. I'm going to get down to brass tacks in just a minute here, but I want you to think for a moment. How often do you and I as Christians walk and wander and stumble? Right here. We have this right here. 
and we wonder why life looks so dark. We wonder why we feel like we're hitting every obstacle in our path, why we trip and stumble at every little thing in our, every little obstacle. You know why? Because we are not walking in the light of the Lord. We are stumbling in the darkness of our own path and wisdom and logic. The brightness of the Lord pierces the darkness of times. The times your life will be dark as night. You will feel like you're in that dark cave where you can't even see the hand in front of your face. And what cuts through the darkness? The light of the Lord. So the night, for a moment, I want us to challenge us to, as verse number five says, to walk in the light of the Lord. To cast off the blinders of materialism, the shades of convenience, the veils of worldly distractions, the cloak of complacency, and embark on a journey of profound, brilliant light, or the light of the Lord. You see, someone said this, the folly of human nature is that even though we know where the answers lie, God's word, we often don't turn there for fear of what it will say. You ever been afraid to pray? Not because of the, or not, not because of what would happen, but because of the answer from God, where he would give you the answer that you know he's going to give you, and you don't want to hear that answer? You want to hear something else? You're like, I can't pray because if I pray, I know what God's going to say. Someone asked this question, how many times in our spiritual lives could we avoid tripping over some obstacle that would cause us to stumble by simply shining the light of Jesus upon it? You're at work tomorrow, and there's a darkness of your boss. Shine the light of Jesus on it and walk in the light of the Lord. Tonight as you go home and you feel the darkness of a temptation from the devil, shine the light of Jesus upon that temptation and see the victory that Jesus Christ provides. If you would, keep your finger on Isaiah and turn to John chapter 8, please. So I want to briefly tonight just explain and show what it looks like to walk in the light of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 8, I'm sorry, John chapter 8, you will find a passage of Scripture where Jesus Christ is speaking. And Jesus Christ in John chapter 8, verse number 12 says this, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the what? Light of the world. Jesus says, I'm the light. Remember Isaiah says this, walk in the light of the Lord. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He that, what's the next word? He that what? Follow. What is the word? Followeth. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. See how John 8, 12 connects to Isaiah chapter 2, verse 5? Isaiah says, walk in the light of the Lord. And if that's all we knew, you could say, I want to, but how? Jesus comes along and fulfills the prophecy from the Old Testament. And he fulfills Isaiah in so many different avenues, but specifically in Isaiah chapter 2, walk in the light of the Lord, and, 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 and Jesus says, I am that light. And to walk in my light is to follow me. And if you follow me, you won't walk in darkness. In case you missed the first three times, he says it. And Jesus says, I am that light, so follow me. So the question begs to be asked, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Now, when they chose songs for tonight, they did not know my message. And yet, we sang these songs, I have decided to follow Jesus, did we not? The Lord lines those things up. I mean, we could line them up, but we didn't. We didn't. The Lord lined that up. I decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. What does it mean when Jesus says, to walk on the light of the world, he that followeth me. That word right there has the idea of someone who is a disciple. To follow Jesus is to be his disciple or to embrace and to follow him. Or following Jesus 
means that I attentively listen and humbly obey. What were disciples called to do? Listen to Jesus and do what he says. If he told them to go untie a donkey, then they should go untie the donkey, right? If he told them to pass out the baskets of bread to feed everyone, then to be a good disciple, you would do that. When he was speaking to be a good disciple, they ought to listen to him, right? So if he's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, a good disciple listens to the master. A bad disciple talks while the master's talking. You with me so far? A good disciple not only hears the, the instruction from the master, but then does it, and a bad disciple ignores the instruction of the master. So to walk in the light of the Lord is to follow the Lord, and to follow the Lord is to be his disciple. And to be his disciple is to attentively listen and humbly obey. You know, my friends, sometimes we want to just make it so complicated and so complex. Well, to be a good Christian, i got to read 13 and a half chapters every single morning between 8 and 8.05. It's not that complex. Just listen to Jesus and do what he says. Just be attentive and then humbly obey. Disciples give us so many good and so many bad examples. Sometimes they argued with Jesus. Those times always make me chuckle when I read the Scripture. When they say, in essence, Lord, you don't know what you're talking about. Lord, you don't know what you're doing. As if the creator of the universe would not know what he's doing. Lord, this isn't going to work. And then they're like, whoa, that worked. That's weird. Because everything Jesus does works. And I would like to think, I'd like to say, boy, I've never argued with the Lord. I bet you wish you could say, I've never argued with the Lord. But the reality is there are times when God speaks. That sometimes we're like, Lord, are you sure you know what you're doing? Are you sure that's exactly what you want? Because I've got a better plan for you. And yet, to be a disciple, to follow the Lord, to walk in his light, to walk in the light of the Lord, is to attentively listen. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And then to do it, without complaint, without argument. A man owned a bird bath. Now, I know when I start these illustrations, sometimes you're like, where is this going, Pastor? A birdbath, really? Could you not get anything a little more dramatic? Hang, hang in there. This birdbath was solar-powered. Now, see me start to connect some dots for me. And when the sun was out shining brightly, then the bath would quickly put up a nice stream of water for the birds. But the moment a cloud of darkness would pass by, instant off. And in our life, when we are in the light, his power flows through us. But the moment we let the clouds of darkness or fear or lack of faith come over us, we miss his power. You see, to walk in the light of the Lord unleashes the power of God in my life and in your life. And there will always be these clouds that want to obscure God in my life and in your life. There will always be these things that want to darken and to hinder the power that God wants to bring. And could it be that the reason you're struggling, could it be the reason you're discouraged, could it be the reason that you have issues right now, the reason that life just isn't working, is because you are not walking under the light of God. You're letting all these other things obscure. Which ultimately, when we do that, we're lifting ourselves up. And we're saying, God, you're not sufficient. Which is in direct opposition to everything that Isaiah says in chapter 2. Every high and lofty thought, every proud and, and lifted up idea and, and deviant device that I've done is in direct opposition to God. And so the challenge is simple tonight. One day, God's going to rule on this earth. And when he rules, God alone will be exalted. Everyone will see God on his throne ruling. It'll be perfect judgments and righteous judgments. And at that day, he will strike down all of the loftiness and all the haughtiness and the pride and man's devices. He will be exalted. But then and now, our challenge is to walk in the light of the Lord simply listening 
and obey. And tonight, when you leave, to listen to God and to say, God, speak to me. I want to follow you. And when he gives you those instructions and issues those commands, then respond to them and walk in the light of the Lord. You see, the children of Israel, throughout Isaiah, you'll find that at the same time that they were worshiping idols, they were pretending to worship God. And they would still have outward um, actions. They would still go to the temple. They would still proclaim to worship God, but their hearts were far from God. And I fear that time Christians were in the same boat. Outwardly, we stand up and sit down at the right time. We bring a big Bible to church, a smile on our face, and our actions are still there, but our hearts are not walking the light. So tonight, like Isaiah says, O house of First Baptist Church, let us walk in the light of the Lord, simply listening and humbly obeying. It's that simple. When we do that, God's power right through us. Music